IPN family. But those who have joined the IPN family later, a brief introduction to Mr. Podar, who is chairman of the Podar World School and a path-breaking educationist and a thought leader on constructing optimal learning environments. Mr. Podar makes a strong distinction between educationist-run schools and businessman-led schools, also personally supports the Beti Bachao, Beti Padao Yojana, and the Impact Foundation that focuses on improving pediatric cancer treatment at the Tata Memorial Hospital. With his education from the University of Texas, Mr. Podar is vested heavily into constantly monitoring and upgrading the quality of the teaching staff that Podar has. His multi-city, multi-brand school has a presence across geographies. Welcome to the session, Mr. Podar. We would love to hear from you. We have eminent educationists in the uh, session today, and we would definitely love to hear what your top 10 priorities on school leaders are. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sawant. It's my absolute pleasure to be here at the IPN Foundation event amongst this August gathering of eminent educationists. And why I love visiting all of the IPN events is um, the level of passion that is there from the school leaders who actually want to go out and make a difference in the lives of the children that are entrusted to us. So I uh, thank you to all the participants who are here. And uh, of course, I must uh, take this opportunity to uh, say that, of course, we all miss the wonderful smiling face of our dear Gaurava Yadav. He's, I think, uh, recovering from uh, some illness, which hopefully should be okay in the next few days. But uh, of course, I think um, the session is going to be moderated beautifully by Dr. Savan. Uh, so, Mr. Podar, uh, we have half an hour given to you, followed by a Q&A session that leaders would have posted in the chat window. Sure. So, what are the top 10 priorities that you think school leaders should uh, think of in this year? Sure. Um, and I'm not going to necessarily give top 10 because I don't want to dilute the level of that. I'm going to give my top priorities. They may not be 10, they may be about six or seven, but uh, basically top priorities that I think are uh, the most important. Um, to start with, the identity of India is built on the foundational blocks of its diversity. In a country where every 100 kilometers there are changes in dialect, culture, costume, and cuisine, it is an onerous task to bring consensus among the various stakeholders on what the real issues are, what their solutions are, and even more importantly, how those solutions should be achieved. Now, education is no different. Each school has its own identity, its own ethos, its own culture. But the one thing that is unique about education is that everyone has an, an opinion on it, on how it should be transacted. The beauty though about education is that it lies in the fact that amidst all this diversity, all this divergence of opinion, there's one thing that binds us all together in unanimity and that is the child. We are all here for the children. If the children were not here, we would not be here discussing this. You would not be going to school. So while the ways to achieve those goals might be different, no one differs on the fundamentals, ensuring that each child entrusted to us can maximize their inherent potential, excel at what they are best in. To develop those values, ethos, and character of our children to become responsible and compassionate 21st century citizens of this world. Now, 2021, last year, it was the first time in the history of mankind that you had schools from all across the world. It didn't matter whether you're a school in Dallas, Dubai, Delhi, or Darwin. We were all confronting and trying to solve the same problems. And what were those questions that we were confronting? When should we reopen school buildings? How will we ensure safety? What measures do we need to take? Are they enough? And what happens even after taking all those measures if someone, God forbid, contracts COVID? How do we steer the new normal of education that is arising into the direction that will truly benefit our 21st century learners the most? How can we turn this crisis in an into an opportunity? And yet here we are at the beginning of 2022, now not confronting the same problems. 
countries across the world have taken different paths to restarting of schools. But for the large part, the learning loss is featured very highly in this course while deciding school reopening plans. Now, most of Western Europe, which has very high Omicron caseloads, has decided to move on with life and that schools have opened as scheduled. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of UK, has gone a step, or rather many steps ahead, and even said in Parliament that masks are not required for children in classrooms anymore. That's an idea that's unpalatable for me at the moment, and I think it's a step too far in my opinion. But my point is reopening physical schools has to be a priority. There are places where children are allowed in restaurants, cinemas, parks, parties, marriages, but cannot enter their classrooms as if COVID is only sitting inside the school building. I was talking to the school leader from London last week and he was shocked. He was absolutely shocked at but how could you be closed for a major part of 22 months now? He can't, he was like, how do you handle the kind of learning loss that the children are going to be suffering? And of course, I'm sure all the people who are on this webinar today and the ones who are going to be watching even a recorded session are amongst a very tiny niche audience that shifted onto online virtual lessons. But that's not where the truth of the entire India lies, does it? We talk about the shift our schools made to online learning, virtual learning, and reduce the learning loss. Of course, we reduced learning loss. But there's no doubt that there are many deficiencies of online learning as compared to physical classes. However, what the bigger point is, what we forget or we may not realize is, as per the UDICE, UDICE, as you know, is under the Education Ministry. As per the UDICE report in 2019, out of over 15 lakh schools in the country, can you guess how many, what percentage of schools what percentage of government schools had internet? You can give your answers in the chat box. Out of over 15 lakh schools in the country in 2019, as per a UDICE report, what percentage of government schools had internet facilities, working internet facilities? These are guesses. Don't worry if you give the wrong answer. There are no minus points. Less than 12%, okay. Yes, Ms. Radhika Srinivasan says less than 5%. The answer for government schools is less than 12% government schools had internet. Less than 30% government schools had functional computer facilities. Now let's not make this a government school, private school thing. It's not about government. I'm not here to do any bashing of any category of schools. Let's talk about schools in India in general. We have over 15 lakh schools in the country in 2019. What percentage of schools, all schools had internet? I said less than 12% if it's government, if it's all schools, what percentage of schools had internet facility? I saw a few answers, but I'm not sure if that's referring to my previous question. 50% Bhavisha Hirani, 50% of all schools had internet. 30% Vaishali Sahani, 60% Simran Kaur, 25%, yes, that's very close, Vishakha Singh, 22%, 22% schools had internet facilities and only 37% schools had functional computer facilities. 37% for functional computer, 22% for internet. So if India has about 300 million students, which by the way is the population, almost the population of the entire United States, our student population is about the entire population of the United States. So if 300 million students is what we have, then around 240 million students had absolutely no schooling online or otherwise for almost two years. When we talk about, oh, we made the shift to virtual learning environments and all of that, do you realize we have not even counted the 240 million students who have had no schooling for two years? 
can you imagine the devastating impact of this for the future of our country there is no better time than a crisis that forces us to grow and wakes us up from the slumber of rudimentary pedagogy we can ill afford another education system that tests students in and prepares students for skills that they won't even require in their 21st century lives we are already into the second quintile of the 21st century we are in 2022 so it's not like as if the 21st century has just started this is the time of transition where the trends are still forming and evolving and it is incumbent upon us especially the education thought leaders and influencers who have to who have to shoulder this responsibility to steer this evolution of education in the direction which will truly benefit our 21st century learners the most a posterity is going to look back at this time as one of those defining moments that comes once in centuries and they're going to either thank us for the direction in which we took education or curse us for not rising up to the occasion when we had the opportunity as we commence 2022 what has changed from 2021 one we know a lot more about the virus two we have vaccines that we know reduce the severity of the disease and yet as we enter 2022 one of the things that continues is that in most states schools are still closed there is a strong argument for safety of children and no doubt safety has to be paramount however it has to be a calculated risk based on data analytics from countries across the world the data is there for us to see even khaimi savedra the education director of world bank has said that there is no justification now for keeping schools in south asia closed due to covid learning poverty which is the inability to read and understand a simple text by age 10 in india is expected to increase from 55 to 70% due to the learning loss and more out of school children there is absolutely no evidence that reopening schools anywhere in the world has led to a surge in corona cases of that country of that place or that schools are not a safe place he has also asserted that it does not make sense from public policy perspective to wait till children are vaccinated as there is no science behind it not a single country has kept that as a prerequisite to opening physical schools even if there are new waves of corona virus closing schools should be the last resort in 2020 and much of 2021 we were navigating in a sea of ignorance we just didn't know what is the best way of combating the pandemic and the immediate reaction of most country in countries in the world was to close schools however time has passed since then and with the evidence coming in since coming in from 2021 we have had several waves across the world and there are several countries which have opened schools successfully without any surge in covid cases even if kids do get infected and especially with omicron the cases are mild and serious illnesses are extremely rare at less than 1% the risks for the children are low but the costs are extremely high in a country like india where the inequalities in edu edu in education were already prevalent before the pandemic and the learning poverty levels were already gigantic we just cannot afford millions of children not to attend schools or even worse drop out drop out of schools forever the continued closure of schools has a devastating impact on future productivity earnings and well-being for the generation of youth their families and the world's economies i'm going to open it up to the audience for a question here there was a world bank report in 2020 that projected what would be the loss to india or to india's future earnings due to the prolonged closure of schools due to covid can you guess how many dollars loss would that be how many million billion whatever how big do you think the loss the projected loss to india's future earnings due to the prolonged closure of schools due to covid would be of course these are guesses i don't expect anyone to know the exact amount unless you have the more, report in more than 500 billion i'm sure very very close that's very close actually it was over 400 billion dollars yeah very close 
So um, usually when I do this, as you all know at the IPN, for those of you all who have watched uh, any of my previous webinars, uh, I asked Gaurava to have some prizes ready to give the right answer, the prize. Here the moderator herself has got the answer right. So, uh, and I remember Dr. Savant, you've got some answers right in my previous questions also about a year ago. Yes. So coming back, over $400 billion was a projected loss to India's future earnings due to the prolonged closure of schools. My number one current priority has to be without a doubt to reopen schools physically, safely and successfully. My next priority that still continues, and it's not something that's gonna change overnight. I have been advocating about this priority since many, many years. And I will keep on shouting out from the rooftops that we need to attract the best minds, the best talent of the country into the teaching profession. My sincere belief is that the country's educational system is strongly and directly proportional to the quality of its teachers. If we are able to attract the best minds of the country into teaching, automatically our education system will become one of the best in the world. Unfortunately, our country is obsessed with getting children to become the next doctor or engineer. And while these are good professions, no doubt, the over obsessive rat race to become a doctor or engineer is not healthy. You enter a room, classroom full of high school or college students, and you ask them, what would you want to become when you grow up? How many times have you heard any child say teacher? It's just not heard of, or very, very few. Or even if you go into a classroom full of B. Ed. students and ask them why they chose to become a teacher, why do you choose a teaching profession? And so often you'll get to hear answers like, you know, I got married and my in-laws, my family, they felt that I should do something easier and light, spend some time with children and not have these long hours and rigors of corporate life. And thus I thought teaching would be perfect for this. Now, how far is that from the truth? Because teaching is not easy by any mean or is not light. And neither is it a job from eight to two that you spend some time with children and come back. Absolutely not. A teacher is a teacher 24 seven. She's thinking about her students even at night while she's putting her own child to sleep. So teaching cannot be the backup option or a last case scenario. You know that I didn't become a doctor, engineer, businessman, accountant or CA or whatever. So I became a teacher. Teaching is the profession that literally builds the future of this country. Investing in teaching is the best investment a country can make. Then why is it that we as a country or politicians or the ones who rule the country, whether it's the state, whether it's whoever it might be, um, why is teaching not the best return on investment? We live in a country, in a democratic system that has elections every five years. The return on investment in education doesn't happen in five years. The fruits of teaching are generally seen at least a decade later when children become adults and start contributing to the country. So the return on investment has a long horizon. So it becomes difficult to become a priority if you're being judged on your five-year performance. Now, I'm not here to only talk about problems, but also the solutions. What do we need to do to attract the best minds of the country, the best talent of the country into teaching? And don't get me wrong. We have some fantastic world-class schools, world-class teachers, absolutely do. Unfortunately though, unfortunately though, these are mere islands of excellence floating on vast oceans of mediocrity. So what do we need to do to achieve these goals? Yes, absolutely right Simran Kaur. This has to be brought about by two most important factors. One, the monetary rewards. It has to be financially lucrative. And two, and I think the most important, even more important than monetary rewards, is respect and reverence in society. Now, people talk about Finland being one of the top performing education systems of the world. All of you know that, I've heard that. I study the in Finland, the Finnish system of education since many, many years, visited inside classrooms, gone and spoken to teachers and staff rooms, um, sat with the National Ministry of Education, uh, spoken to principals, and 
one of the things that differentiates Finland from men, most other countries is that teaching or teachers are the most respected profession in the entire country, even more than doctors or engineers. Um, I'm going to digress a little bit. I'll, while I was speaking about this, I remembered about when I was sitting in the staff room of teachers and um, in Finland, and I was speaking to the teachers there and I asked them, so, you know, what class do you teach? And they're like, um, we teach the pre-primary. And I said, oh, wonderful. So what's your qualification? And they're like, uh, we are PhDs. I said, so you're a doctorate in education, you're a PhD, and you choose to teach the pre-primary students. And they're like, yeah, of course, why not? I mean, why would we not be doing that? I said, well, in India, the typical way of doing it is if you're, you know, a PhD or a doctorate in education, you'll likely be teaching at the university level or maybe at the higher school level. And they're like, but you know, we can make the most difference in the child's brain, which is developing the fastest in the first six or seven years, rather than at the higher grades. It's a just totally different perspective. Um, so I was talking about teachers, the most respected profession out in Finland. In order to get selected for the equivalent of what is a B. Ed. in the university, you have to be in the top 10% of applicants. Only one out of 10 who apply even get selected for the B. Ed. course. And if you do finish the B. Ed., even lesser than that, get selected to become teachers. Now, I am not at all suggesting that you can take one set of solutions and take it and parachute it into another country and it's all going to like be a panacea and everything's going to work. It doesn't work like that. Of course, it has to be tailor-made for the um, uh, circumstances of each individual country. Now, in India, we have such a rich heritage, culture, legacy of Guru Deva Bhava. Yet, with the degradation of time and something that was even more apparent during the 2021 lockdowns, was the loss of this respect and reverence given to teachers. We have to bring back our le legacy of Guru Dev Bhava if we want to attract the best talent into teaching. My next priority is to get over this over obsession of marks. We're sitting at the end of January. Those of you who are North India are probably freezing right now. People in Bombay, it's hit about 23 degrees in the afternoon and are freezing right now because Bombay doesn't really get cold. And, you know, if it goes down to about 10 or 12 degrees Celsius, all of Bombay gets its sweaters and jackets out and people in North India are like, come on, this is nothing. This is our two in the afternoon temperature. Um, so we're sitting in the end of January. And what is it that we are all running behind come Jan, Feb, March? We are all running behind this board exam. Of course, now CBSC has got broken it up into two different phases, which I think is a very good idea. Um, but what's the most favorite thing of this Indian and many Asian education systems? That holy grail that all our students are made to chase. Marks, tests, scores. Sounds so scary. I mean, what are these tests? For the large part, they're nothing more than memory retention assessments. So if you got 90 and you got 75, somebody else got 75, it tells me that you can memorize better. But in the 21st century, are the children going to need better memorization capacities? No, because today, today's children already have infinite amount of information available on their fingertips. By the time they grow up, they will be auto-prompted with artificial intelligence and other technologies with the information that they need to complete their next task. So if you get 90 and you can memorize better, you still don't know as much as Google. And the next kid, if they know how to make the best out of Google or whatever the AI that's going to prompt them, that is what's really required. Yet we as an education system are testing and valuing their memorization skills. Tests are meant to be diagnostic. They are meant to diagnose the strengths and the weaknesses of the student so the teacher can adjust her lesson delivery accordingly. That's all what tests are meant to be. Now, you think about it, you go for a blood test to a diagnostic center and you come back and maybe your sugar is high or your cholesterol is high or triglycerides are high or whatever it might be. You don't get a label on your forehead when you come back sugar high or triglycerides are high or whatever it might be. That's a diagnostic test. It's meant to diagnose what the strengths and weaknesses of your body are so you can adjust your lifestyle accordingly. Tests. 
that the children give are exactly the same. They're supposed to just diagnose the strengths and weaknesses of the student so teacher can adjust her lesson delivery accordingly. But tests in our country have become a way to put a label on a student's forehead. You get 95, they write genius on your forehead. And you get 80 average or above average or 40 and they write these pathetic terms like duffer or whatever. And who has given anybody the right to put a label on a student's forehead on basically a test that is memorizing the, that is measuring the child's memorization ability? And it's not only India, it's many Asian education systems, including China. I don't know if um, y'all are following what's happening with our Eastern neighbor in China. China has also been a very academic, rigorous country, very over-obsessed with marks. They used to have the one-child policy. Now what's happening in China, they want more population. They are encouraging people to have up to three children because of the one-child policy, what happened is that their population is now aging and the working age population is becoming smaller. So while they have tried to incentivize people to have more kids, it's still not working. And why, the, why is it not working? What is the number one reason it's not working for them in China? Why do parents not want to have more kids? Because the level of stress and the amount of finance a parent's disposable income goes in into that academic tuition. And I'm not talking about tuition in school. I'm talking about after school tuition and extra classes and ed tech classes is so high. It's so high that parents are saying, no, I can't afford to have a second kid. I can't afford to have a third kid. China, as a result, has gone and banned ed tech from their country for all these big ed tech giants have been overnight banned. It's amazing. These, com these companies that were worth billions of dollars of valuation were by the Chinese government thrown out because the amount of pressure that was being put on parents to basically beat the other kid um, was making their plan of having more children not successful. Now, we care in India so much about the marks a child scored in the exam, but we forget to care whether they leave a mark with their life. This overzealous pursuit of running behind cramming and hoarding knowledge is an antiquated concept. We have an anachronistic education system. We have to bring it up to par. In the 21st century, the world economy is not going to reward you for how much you know, but for what you can do with what you know, not for the amount of knowledge that you have, but for how you apply the knowledge that you have. The focus must shift from test-based accountability to trust-based responsibility. The focus must shift from content mastery to competence mastery. All of you who are teachers, educators, especially in the CBSE system, you think about it when you were growing up, getting a 90 was such a big deal, right? Our previous education secretary, Sri Anil Swarupji, he really advocated hard to reduce this marks inflation that happens in all the boards of education in India. Students scoring above 90% in the 10th standard CBSC jumped 58 times in 2010 and 11, 1,200 students, 1,200 students scored above 90% in standard 10 CBSE exams. In 2020, from 1,200, the number jumped to 70,000 from 1,200 children. And that's not that our kids have suddenly got that much smarter. It's the marks inflation that is going on and the over obsession of marks that we keep running behind. With automation, technology, and now industrial revolution 4.0, we don't need our students to be second class robots, but instead be first class humans. And that is my next priority. In a world where we can teach students to be anything, my dear educators, teach them to be kind, compassionate citizens. Let's build first class humans. What are the traits that are inherent to humans, which no technology can replace or do a better job of? And what is the role of the educator in such times? Is it just of being an information or a content delivery person? No, the role of the educator today has moved to that of being a coach, a mentor, and a facilitator of learning. We all know that technology can easily deliver content, but it's only a human teacher that can inspire, 
encourage and spark that imagination, inquiry and curiosity inside a child. So my next priority for you, dear teachers, dear educators, this is the time to truly espouse, live, breathe, imbibe in our children and within ourselves, those 21st century skills that we all once sagaciously foretold. And what were those skills? The ability to cope with limited resources, the ability to be agile, adaptable, flexible, the ability to be resilient, the skill of crisis management, self-reliance, independence, become critical thinkers, problem solvers. Which of these skills do our exams measure? Teachers are not weapons of mass instruction. In fact, teachers who believe their role is to mass instruct tend to become teachers of mass destruction, destructing a lot of the creative capacities of a child's growing brain. Education is not a transactional phenomenon. It isn't only about transacting curriculum. The fundamental crux on what good education is based is the human relationship. As you know, my sessions always have some interactivity, so I'm going to go into a little quiz here. Since Dr. Sawant has won a lot of prizes in the past, she's going to share a few prizes if you get the answers right. Um, to all of you listening, what is the um, learning center of the brain called? The, what part of the brain is the learning center of the brain? Cerebellum, medulla, no, no, sorry. Cerebral hemisphere, no, sorry, Simran. Amygdala, very good, Aditya, spelling is wrong, but very good. It's the amygdala, A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A, -A. amygdala. Amygdala, sorry, 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 I'm so sorry. I asked you about the learning center. I've got confused. Hippocampus, yes, Vishaka Singh has got right. Hippocampus is the learning center of the brain. My next question was going to be, what is the emotional center of the brain, which of course has already been answered, is the amygdala. Amygdala is the emotional center of the brain and hippocampus is the learning centers of the brain. The amygdala is located right next to and connected to the hippocampus. I'm not giving you a neuroscience lecture. All I'm trying to tell you here is the emotional centers of our brains are connected and right next to the learning centers of our brain. What can you deduce from that? What can you analyze from that? The quality of learning is directly proportional to the emotional state of the child, of the learner. So if the child's brain is curious, challenged, purposeful, there's a purpose to your lesson, then the learning is going to happen much better. The quality of learning will be much better. And by the way, this is emotional state of a child's brain and not EQ. EQ is emotional quotient, how a child handles their emotions. That's different. So, and the amazing thing, you know, when I ask these questions, if there's children or students in the audience, they will immediately, you know, in eight seconds, you'll suddenly get about 10 correct answers because children will go to Google, type in all these questions and immediately give you even more detailed answers that I could have even imagined. Um, so the children, the Google generation, aren't they? Um, so my next priority here is you have to build heuristic learning. You've heard of pedagogy. This is heutagogy. Heutagogy is heuristic learning. What is heuristic learning? Student-led learning and not teacher-dominated instruction. Self-directed, self-owned, self-led learning. The next thing I'm going to tell you, I hope you can remember this when you are transacting your lessons in the future. A good teacher knows when to teach. An excellent teacher knows when not to. A lot of times as teachers, you need to take a step back and let that heuristic learning take place naturally. Our brains are hardwired to learn more and want to learn more. The highest concentration of endorphin receptors, the feel-good chemical receptors, are located in the hippocampus, in the learning centers of our brain. Our brains are 
hardwired to want to find joy in learning. A good teacher knows when to teach. An excellent teacher knows when not to. Know when to take that step back. The quality of teaching is only as good as the quality of learning happening in each child. Make the children the owners of their lessons, of their learning. Put them front and center and dispel your own fear that the child won't be able to do it. It is your role as a teacher, as the educator, to instill in the child trust, faith, belief, and put them in the front and center. At the worst, what will happen? The child will stub their toe. The child will make a mistake. So what? The child will learn from this and only get wiser and stronger. Research has proven time and again that children live up to labels. If you instill faith, belief, and trust in them to do well, they will do well. You make them believe they're not capable of doing it, and they most likely will not be able to do it successfully. So whether you believe they can do it or they can't, both times you're going to be right. So my priority here is to build independent, strong, self-assured learners through hutagogy. Of course, we know India is a country where parents care very strongly about the academic rigor. And even though I'm one of the strongest advocates against this unhealthy pursuit of marks, I must address the concerns that even if you want your child to achieve higher marks, there's a better way to go about it. As children grow up and close, get closer to their board years, parents and even schools sometimes start replacing sports and activities in their lives with a book, a desk, and a chair. Now, in today's world, we care so much, about, so much about recharging our mobiles' batteries. You know, we have to make sure our batteries are charged. But we forget to recharge our most important organ, our brain's batteries. If you replace physical activity with a book, a desk, and a chair, you're only going to achieve a dull child. If you really want to recharge the brain's batteries, you need to bring back those dose chemicals, the dose of happiness. What is that dose? Dopamine oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, the feel-good, happy chemicals, when you feel confident, strong. And how do we get these chemicals? By letting children be children. Let them run, jump, dance, play their favorite sport, yoga, exercise, during their study breaks, whatever physical activity they enjoy. You ask toppers, what was your routine before the exam? I don't think I have ever heard any topper say, that my routine before the exam was just study, study, study. Every topper that I have asked have said, I spent time doing what I liked. Yes, I started learning. I started my portion early. I started studying early, well before the exam started. But the day before the exam, yeah, I took out one hour to do this, to, to play my favorite sport, to dance, to do aerobics, yoga, exercise, whatever it is. No point in sitting for long hours with a book in front of your lap if your brain is outside thinking of the mango tree or about the cricket match, children learn best on their feet and not on their seats. And since students have their year end board exams coming up soon, I must conclude my session with a message to my dear, dear students, if there are any listening in. So dear students, stay calm, composed, have faith, belief, confidence in your abilities. Don't let anyone bring you down. Don't let anyone pressurize you. You were not born or meant to be cooked in an academic pressure cooker. With that, I'd like to take it back to the moderator and we can take some questions as, as the moderator wishes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Podar. Very uh, relevant points put through and I'm sure the leaders in this webinar are craving to ask you questions. So I think we have Mr. Parush Arora raising the hand. You could ask your question, sir. Hi, good evening, Mr. Padar. I'm sorry I'm sitting in the car and listening to your session, an amazing, amazing session, uh, uh, words which you've expressed. So as a school owner, I've got a couple of doubts. Number one, how to actually convince and handhold the parents with respect to uh, doing such activities, which you just said it. Uh, being a school owner, uh, I really don't know. There are approximately 87 odd participants in this session. I'm sure out of those 87, 80 will be approximately teachers or, or principals. Out of those 80, if you see and scroll anybody's Facebook or website, 
the first thing which will pop up is the last year result, which can attract more admissions. So what is your piece of advice? I can understand as in, if you correlate both the things as a school owner, obviously it is important to um, portray and show the result. But on the other hand, what you... I think you got muted. Mr. Aurora? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I hope I'm there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, as a school owner, yeah, I have to portray my result. But on the other hand, what you just said is also important because we also have kids. We need to improve our kids and we need to improve the kids which are, which are there in the schools. So how we can actually uh, implement, uh, because this session cannot be shown and parents will ultimately uh, uh, see what, uh, as in, at the time of admissions, IIT Delhi is what they focus on. The MBBS admission is what they focus on. So how can we um, moderate this? How can we actually explain it to our population, uh, to the students and to the parents? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Aurora, for your question. Wonderful question. And um, I first of all appreciate that you're joining us from the car, but I hope you're parked on the side and not um, driving actually while you're asking that. So I hope you're safe and sound out there. Um, Coming to your question, uh, yes, very relevant. And I think as school owners, as school leaders, as principals, as coordinators and teachers, our job is not only to educate students, it's also to educate parents. You're absolutely right. Uh, the society runs behind marks and that's what I'm trying to advocate for. And it's not something that's going to change overnight. Um, even Sundar Pichai in his interview at IIT Kharagpur said, that it is not a necessary prerequisite to get into the top 5, 10, 20% of universities for a, for a successful life. Um, the NEP has really raised the right notes in a lot of ways and try to shift that focus from content mastery to competence mastery and not only run behind marks. But that being said, you're absolutely spot on. How will we do that if eventually colleges if, okay, why should parents send their children to school so that they maximize their inherent potential and excel at what they're best in? Why do parents send their children to schools for the large part so that they can get into the best college? If you need, what do you need to get into the best college? Your best marks. So if your best marks are in physics, chemistry, biology, maths, and you want to take up science, yeah, you're probably going to be looked at more preferably than say if, your marks are really good in something, another subject, or it doesn't even have to be marks, some other skill. So yes, you're absolutely right. We have to change uh, the end goal, but it is a mindset change that is not gonna happen overnight. People like you, like all the educators here are going to have to advocate for it strongly because that is what the children are gonna need in their lifetimes. They're not necessarily going to need only that certificate that I came out of IIT or IM or from whichever the university. It's going to be the life skills that we taught them in school also. And that is what our responsibility is. Of course, it's a balance of both, but we are already moving towards that. Today, the value of life skills, the value given to life skills, even in parents' minds, is far higher than say 10 years ago. It's still a long way to go, but it doesn't mean we haven't made progress. We have to keep on going at it. And I'm I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that we can um, try to achieve that as soon as possible. I think that answers his question. We have Ms. Indu Sharma raising her hand. You could ask your question, ma'am. Good evening, Mr. Badar. Such a fruitful and rewarding session as always. Pleasure to have you as a speaker. Uh, I just wanted to add, Mr. Badar, that Whenever parents are crazy about marks, allow those parents to interact with children in your campus, right? When they get to see the kind of confidence they have and how they say their mind, not something which uh, they memorized, any parent would choose your school when they see happy, vibrant campus. I think confidence and communication skills that we are able to inculcate in children then uh, parents would not really look at this 99% marks or IITs and they are definitely going to make to those prestigious institutions. So as you said, I think in every session you 
uh, emphasize that children need to be happy children. Happy children definitely learn better. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. And, and we uh, have experience in my 35 years that happy children love coming to school. They love listening to the teacher. And more than anything, it's not only love showered on children, let them experience respect so that they learn to respect the adults, teachers, and parents and other people in the society. So we must respect and make them feel okay. They can disagree with us. Only the thing is they need to take care of their tone when they disagree with teachers or parents. If we give them that freedom, they are bound to make progress in every field. And thank you so much. I wish we could have you n number of times. Hey, besides that, I'd like to add... The public school, Patiala. Okay. Besides this, I'd also like to add, you know, the most important thing is that we need to accept them for what they are. Yes, exactly. Acceptance of children for what they are is more important than labeling them as Mr. Podar was saying, right? So that's very, that's very respect. important. Respect yeah, you know, for what they are, who yes. they are. Absolutely. And I think sometimes we get too caught up on trying to meet the parents' expectations. Uh, we're trying to live up to uh, even the previous question that asked was, you know, but parents are going to expect this or want that and want these kind of marks. If you had many decades ago asked people who were running bullock carts that what kind of, what do you want? They'd be like, you know, I want the better bullock cart. I want the cushioning on my seat. I want better wheels. Well, somebody went out there and created cars, invented cars. Sometimes you just don't know what's out there until yeah. you haven't, you, you've got it. So I think as educators, as progressive minded educators, the ones who know what is important, it is our, it is incumbent upon us. It's we are responsible for the change, that evolution of education that's happening right now. All of the people watching here are responsible for it because you have hundreds or thousands of students entrusted to you every year. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have Ms. Lakshmi oh, Kumar. Please ask your question, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Poda, for a very enriching uh, conversation and uh, your talk. Uh, I'm glad you touched upon the one of the crucial stakeholders, the teacher community. Uh, while, you know, a lot of schools, uh, you know, kept sanity in terms of teacher relationship, we also have heard of extensive exploitation uh, retention, uh, sorry, attrition, uh, not paying salaries or clubbing classes. So, you know, for whatever situations that uh, that uh, urge schools to do, uh, you know, that there is one community that's absolutely fatigued, overstretched and uh, less valued. And uh, of course, they are frightened right now to return back. And when we reopen schools, uh, you know, how do we bridge this trust deficit? And, uh, you know, and schools may have their own sides of story. I'm not even taking uh, a side to say who is wrong or who is right. And that teachers have been asked to become this multitudinal Mahakali with, you know, many, many uh, upskilling and readiness for, you know, uh, hybrid. And, you know, I realize hybrid has two elements to it. And when you have young children in front of you, let's say a grade one or two or kindergarten, and then there are children sitting at home, you can't really have an online offline simultaneously. So, you know, it's going to have challenges of the same teacher teaching the online school first and then come to the offline or vice versa. So how are we going to heal the community of teachers and build this trust back? And, uh, you know, how do we set our priorities in that uh, direction? Um, I must say you're absolutely right about the multitudinal Mahakalis. And I must say they actually excelled at it so well, even though they had all these different facets and gamut of uh, um, different teaching styles and then handling WhatsApp messages from parents and then some parents bombing the class and coming in and telling and they handled it very, very well. Yes, you're right that there were some schools who perhaps were not able to, or perhaps were able to, and still did not retain teachers. Um, those kind of schools that did not have that kind of faith and trust in teachers are obviously going to have a tougher time in getting good quality teachers to stay with them. 
Uh, there are also, of course, schools who we know have had very, very difficult financial statuses where I think in Rajasthan, about 12 school owners committed suicide because of the kind of financial condition um, that their schools were in. It was a very tough time for all stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, school owners, etc. How do we bridge the trust deficit? How do we get that back? Um, very, very difficult to do that because trust is not something that's built in a day, but it's something that can be lost in a second. Um, so it's very, very important that you have to start brick by brick, keep at it, value teachers. Like I put in most of my um, um, webinars or in my posts on social media, Guru Dev Bhava, we have to bring back the respect, the reverence that teachers deserve in our country. Teachers cannot be relegated to census data, to clerical work of calculating how many, or some, there's some campaign going on. So go to the campaign, please. This is not what our gurus, can you imagine hundreds of years ago if our guru was asked to do all these kinds of things? These are gurus and they deserve to be treated like gurus and not um, for all these clerical or, or kuch nahi hai, chalo, wahan par bhej do, ye kara do, wo kara do. Why? Our students not the priority? Why should my students not have their teacher? Why should the teacher not be able to bring out the best nature of students? I think it will have to start by that, but there, there is no easy answer to build that trust deficit because as I said, it, it'll take, it takes a long, long time to build trust and we need to do it one, one brick by one brick. Uh, Mr. Podar, we, we are uh, a congregation of private school uh, leaders. Uh, just think about the government school teachers, a pathetic state that they are in. Right now, the vaccination drive, because of which they're all uh, set on this task of trying to cover the uh, children who are aged 15 to 18. They're moving door to door, getting kids vaccinated. Is that the job of teachers? So, you know, uh, and a major chunk of children uh, go to government schools. So it's so important that uh, the Ministry of Education, be, be it uh, state-wise or the Government of India, should take a very strong stand. When we are saying respect and reverend teachers, this has to come from right top up. Absolutely. If the Ministry takes a very strong stand on this, I think we can bring in a great transformation in the field of education. Once teachers are allowed to do what they're supposed to be doing, I'm sure they'll be able to do a wonderful job with children. 100%. It has to start yes. from the top, but even at the local level, district level, yeah. I think at the top, when we do speak and advocate through associations, through um, organizations, educational bodies, um, I will stick my neck out and say, say out here that uh, the minds of the people at the top is are very progressive. They yes. do actually believe uh, whichever board we're talking about at the mm -hmm. ministry level, at the bureaucrat level, they genuinely do agree with all these things. Right. Um, however, just agreeing is not enough. Yes. Eventually what happens on the ground is what really matters. It right. doesn't matter if everyone has great intentions, but it's still pervasive all across our country that teachers are not treated with the kind of respect that they deserve. And yes. that is then that cycle that we get into that mm. why does one want to become a teacher? Yeah. Do I want to become a teacher so that I'm going to go and make sure that every door-to-door -door vaccination is happening? Hmm. Hey, forget it. Then maybe I won't become a teacher. I'd rather go into some other profession. Right. That's true. Yeah, we have uh, Ms. Vishaka Singh wanting to ask a question. Very good evening and Jain to Raghav sir and Rajeshwari ma'am. So uh, I just wanted to know, sir, that uh, even uh, as you said that students, they should not be labeled as according to their marks which they are uh, gaining in the examination but many times it happens that during the examination especially i'm talking about the board students they don't take participate in any kind of extracurricular activity and they are like that my education and my study is going to get affected suppose anyhow if we teachers convince them 
to participate in those activity but again there is a pressure from the parent side that no you have to uh, concentrate on your study education is very important no need to go for any extra curricular activities and this automatically create pressure on teachers principals and even the whole management in the school system to how to tackle those parents and the biggest challenge is when the parents when they are from a very remote area like a smaller city where their education is also not so much so this creates a challenging uh, situation in front of the teachers so how to face how to do the counseling of those parents because i believe that bringing the change in the education is not only dependent to the teachers not to the principal not to the students but also the role of parents is very 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 important so just i want you to uh, help us out with this absolutely and jahin to you as well vishaka um very good pertinent question and as i said we are not only educating students our role as educators in 2022 and 2021 is educating parents as well um let me give a little bit of a scientific i've already explained about um it has to be done with patience and all of that but i'll give you a scientific explanation of why extra curriculars especially sporting or physical activity is important for the child so if the parent wants better marks they are all running behind academic rigor i want more marks for my child okay great how are you going to get that better marks what do you need to do to achieve that better marks the child's brain should be at its optimal capacity the front part of the child's brain is the prefrontal cortex any not child a human brain is a prefrontal cortex which basically is the ceo of the brain controls all your decision making executive functioning of the body when a child is stressed you put a book in front of a child and say you have to do this if you don't do this what will happen how will you achieve this sharma ji ka beta has gone and done that what are you going to achieve and all of that kind of pressure and societal pressure is put on that child or no you can't participate in extra curricular activities annual day mein kaise karoge ye competition mein kaise karoge wo sab chodo you sit and study first tum study nahi karte bachche all those kinds of things are adding pressure to the child then you will get a group that's group a of parents then you have a group b of parents No, no, no. We don't pressurize the child. We allow the child this and that, and then you'll find before the exam, the day before the exam, mother is fasting. Why is mother fasting? No, 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 no. Bachika exam hai kal. I actually heard of one mother. Um, no, no. We are not those kind of parents. We are very liberal and progressive. But the child, you know, the pen that the child is going to write with, that pen, we went to a particular mandir yaha pe and got it blessed by that god. now all these things are adding pressure to the child's brain even if it's not overt it's subliminal what is happening is with that pressure with that stress a chemical called cortisol is entering the child's brain what is the mood of a child before entering an exam nervous stressed anxiety fear and what happens with nervousness strength stre stress anxiety fear tension cortisol floods the prefrontal cortex and reduces the ability of the child to perform at its best and it's not only the last few minutes before the exam it's even the days before the exam if you want your child to do better in the exam to the parents that you are asking how do we tackle how do we counsel those parents tell them the science behind it you want your child's brain to be at its best optimal capacity when giving the exam or when studying or learning for that exam you want the best brain absorption rate of what the child is learning make sure you have enough of study breaks in those study breaks the child is doing what they enjoy and enjoy does not mean instagram or snapchat or whatever these days kids are on i'm talking about physical activity so dancing swimming aerobics yoga running jumping playing cricket football whatever it is in the study breaks do this they have to then parents say No, no, no. Tomorrow morning exam. You sleep only five hours today. Tomorrow morning, five hours. You wake up early and starts. You get ready for exam. The child's brain recharging the brain's batteries. Sleep well. Don't sleep for only four, five hours. If the child is used to seven, seven hours, eight hours, the child needs that time to absorb what the child learned during the day into the brain, into the hippocampus. Eat nutritious food. A lot of parents have this thing. अच्छा मेरा लाडला इज गोइंग टू हैव हैव एग्जाम टुमारो मैं तो उसके लिए पाव भाजी छोले भटूरे जलेबी रसगुल्ला ऑल दीज थिंग्स खिलाऊंगी दैट्स द वर्स्ट थिंग यू कैन डू चाइल्ड वांट्स टू इट मैगी 
हा बेटा दो मिनट में मैगी लाई अरे प्लीज डोंट मेक दम इट ऑल दैट मेक दम इट हेल्थी न्यूट्रिशियस फूड दैट विल कीप द माइंड एंड ब्रेन एक्टिव After the exams are over, let the child eat Maggi if you want to. But during the exams, healthy, protein-rich, active foods, and not overeating that they get drowsy. So if parents ask for or, or, or are trying to fight back or say no, 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 don't, I don't want the child to focus on these things. This is what will make your child get better marks. You want marks at the end of the day? Focus on that. Focus on the science behind it. To give, show them examples of toppers. or interviews of toppers you know the favorite thing that happens come april may when the exam results come out every newspaper and nowadays every whatsapp education group is filled with that inter that one photo of that principal feeding a laddu to the topper of the school and then there will be one article below it standard article what was uh, what do you want to achieve what course do you want to do and what was your exam routine exam routine of toppers is not study 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 full time let those parents who you are asking about read those interviews of those toppers and see that your child needs good sleep good food and good study breaks with physical activity to get back that dopamine oxytocin serotonin endorphins in the child's brain the good chemicals in the child's brain so they can perform at their optimal capacity when they give the exam and get better marks if marks is really the target this is the better way to get those marks or higher marks Okay. Uh, we have a Seema. Good evening, and Good evening, to all the educators. Uh, first of all, my question is, uh, I have two questions which is striking in my mind. Uh, I want to have a clarity on my questions. and they are addicted with the various uh, games and uh, they are spending their times with the various uh, sites of the um, internet also and uh, after seeing their presence uh, in a short span of time when once the students they came back to the school we saw the students they are getting irritated a lot they have lost their patience as well as it was very tough to counsel those students and what is your opinion raghu sir you want to say for such kind of uh, students if we get in the future after one year or the six months if schools will reopen so again we will face the same challenges again so how to tackle such kind of students and how to counsel them i want to know the first thing and the second thing the cbse what the changes has been made in the new examination pattern eight months already the students are uh, connected with the textbook and they were focused on the multiple uh, choice question or objective type uh, questions they have appeared and two months the students will struggle with the practicals again they were going to have a subjective examination so meanwhile they have forget uh, they have forgotten all the writing skills and within a short span of time how they will develop that writing skill once again i want to know it from your answer okay thank you thank you so much for that question um the second question first i personally don't think that they're going to forget or lose their writing skills in a few months i mean i think kids are quite resilient um when the topic of mobile phones and being addicted to that um and this i'm saying more from a parents point of view not right now and i know your question was from an educator's point of view and i'll address that as well uh when parents ask that oh my child is addicted to the mobile phone he doesn't stop only she doesn't leave her phone and all um i tell parents that dear parent um give your child first of all your presence and not your presence give your child the present of time of your time if you yourself as a parent are not ready to give your child that time or when the child has so many questions and instead of coming when he comes to you and you're like no no go and ask somebody else go and ask somebody else if you can't give time to the child and you yourself are too busy on your mobile phone all the time then what is the child going to learn children learn by imitation so when they see their parents and their family members sitting on the mobile phone all the time or their laptops or their screens whatever it is that's what the child is learning now in terms of an educator perspective um yes there will be children who have been stuck inside home stuck inside maybe the compounds um and not have that much physical activity i think the best way the absolute best way of getting rid of irritability um other such issues is get the child to be active give more pt periods 
let the children be children let them run around let them sweat let them fall a little bit no problem let children be children play is the work of childhood children learn best on their feet and not on their seats so it's critical that um if they have if they are developing these psychological issues of irritability tension not wanting to learn just being fed up all the time um i think let them run around give them extra pt period let them play football whatever it is and get back those good chemicals and automatically they'll be in the best frame of mind to tackle the next lesson i'd like to add here mr podar in fact schools will have to uh, rethink about the timetable now because it cannot be a you know seven period schedule with a lunch break in between there has to be a break after every period because getting the children adapt to school is more important than them learning at school Absolutely. it's it's very very important that's actually one of the things that finland does so well so um, if finland has six periods in a, in each day hmm. 45 minutes is the period and 15 minutes is the break after every single period yes that recess of 15 minutes is so good it's so critical and children are allowed to do what they want in that 15 minute period so yes, yes you have children who are running around somebody is playing football somebody is playing whatever sport then there are children who are climbing trees getting berries out there mm-hmm. are those children on the side who and in finnish schools the government schools mm-hmm. you'll have pianos lying around guitars lying around so children are jamming they are going and playing their own pianos they are mm-hmm. getting that part of their brain um um going so i think it's a very very good suggestion it's a tough one we've tried to actually implement it in quite a few of our schools a yeah. uh, lot of resistance from teachers parents saying that how can you have so many recesses we don't send our children just to khel kood ke liye nahi bhejte but the, the science behind it is that you're getting the child's brain ready to tackle the lesson better yes. and um, what we have in our schools is this thing called the happy time um where about 5 6 minutes in the day a child becomes the dj of the day okay. um, and the principal or the teacher select the child and uh, on the basis of good behavior good behavior it's not in terms of uh, one who is obedient but one who maybe helped another child who was getting bullied hmm. somebody who went out of their way to do some, some, something right the child becomes dj of the day goes to the principal's cabin and can play any song not hmm. not objectionable songs yes. but like dj bravo champion champion or hmm. um, some other patriotic kind of song ma to je salam yeah. they can play yeah. that and the whole school is then playing on that song mm. and in that time everyone is encouraged from principal to pion mm. students everybody included goes out into the passage into the atelier mm. in the classrooms if they wish and dance just freak out yes you see the kind of level of that lesson that pre happy time and post happy time and the difference in that lesson the quality of that lesson teachers are like this is so much better the child who was sitting quiet not listening looking all around is now suddenly paying attention i think uh i think dr sawan's screen is frozen yes dr deep khare please go ahead uh good evening mr podar it is always pleasure and privilege to listen to you and Thank you. this young uh, edu leader is making many oldies to really think all the time congratulations no 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 no, no, no. please 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 don't say that i think the youth is inside the heart i fully agree because no, i not the number of white hair that you might have or not very true very true i i had just two things to share and i will need your reflections also indirectly i found that we have a lot of common uh, thinking all together after this pandemic i think the most important thing for all educators to realign their expectation from children somehow i feel that we all want these two years to be nullified and the life become as usual we do not we are not ready to afford we don't don't want to really get changed with the new normal i also would like to add one more point here that somehow when we say the teachers started teaching online how many of them have really started teaching what is required as per online teaching as compared to what they used to do offline these are the two things i wanted to bring to your uh, means uh, the thought process and few more things uh, recently in my school we started something called a special break time 
where the children will join the Zoom rooms and they will be allowed to go to different breakout rooms as per their choices. There will be no teacher and nobody will guide them to do anything. They're having break in the Zoom rooms. So they chit chat, they talk about, then we started asking them that anybody would like to do any activity. When they say something, I want to do drawing, okay, those who want to do drawing with him, please go to that room. And they can sometimes have snacks together, they're having lunch together. And one PD teacher with in, in requirement, he is also teaching them something special. A child is doing skip, skip rope and whatnot. These are the few things which is, uh, you know, bring them to their normal life. And as far as the writing is concerned, I am fully agreeing with you that nobody has forgotten writing. They still need to have the appropriate enough reasons to write. The time when it comes, you know, I feel very strongly about the ability of children. If we make them understand that this is time to do that, they will be all fully be able to do it. Of course, it will take its own time and we should be patient about it. As we all know, we, we have been patient for the last one and a half year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a very good point. Yeah, I loved your idea of the breakout rooms and then children decide for themselves if they want to do skipping or they want to do drawing or whatever. And that absolutely is heuristic learning. That's exactly uh, what I was... Mr. Yeah. Porter, there's no teacher intervention at all. No yeah. teacher can say anything except they stop fighting or something that goes on, something is going beyond the limit of speaking kind of thing, going, you know, haywire. Yeah. Otherwise, they have not, because I'm sick and tired of prescription by the teachers. We want, them, yesterday we had a webinar in which somebody was asking, the children are not even able to decide what they want to do in class 12th. From class 1, we do not let them do what they want. We prescribe them, do this, do this, do this. Now this child, when he do, does all the things, he, he rather become a slave. He, does, he can choose a, a cool drink or a, a mobile type, or he can choose a laptop type or a channel of, uh, he can't choose a book. I mean, so those many people are sitting here. Let me know, when have you seen a child going to a bookshop and picking a book of physics? That will tuition teacher will tell, or a school teacher will tell, or the parent will tell. When a child can pick up a book, sir, will he pick up a girlfriend or even to a career or a stream? It is very, very uh, means unexpected, impossible. If you are not able to teach them, what is what makes them happy? What do, do they like? They can't be successful at all. But we are busy doing something which we feel is right. I'm sincerely totally against all the examination which you conduct. You were just talking about toppers. They, they, they're topping and topping in what? The topper of what, by the way? They were very good that day of the exam. Next day. What they topped in, is it useful next day, next to next day? They're un unemployable, don't we know that? The topping is something which is not going to be used by anybody or required by anybody. Aren't we that's, what, that's what uh, Mr. Podar is trying to communicate. Yeah, uh, it's a highly debatable topic. You know, the entire system needs to be transformed. That, that's that's uh, the need of the hour. Mrs. Saman, the, the key is the teacher. If the teachers are told what is required as a permanent learning, Permanent learning, something you teach today, you use after 10 years. Right. If a child can handle money, not the mass question, that is better. That's true. Repair his bicycle, then doing a practical in physics lab, not required. Learning made more practical. Happen, but this is what I think is uh, possible. Ah, right, Thank, you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? So uh, I think we come to the close of today's session. Uh, Mr. Podar has listed out six priorities and you can always uh, interject me, Mr. Podar, if I'm uh, not on the track. The first one is to reopen schools. It's high time schools reopened so that children come back to school. They will be safe because schools are taking care of the sanitation part, the safety part of the children. The next point that he highlighted was to attract the best minds in school. Because once you have an excellent teacher, there's transformation taking place in the child. Then was getting over with the obsession of exams. Because rote learning is not going to fetch any brownie points. It may at the most give you a good mark sheet. But for a child to be successful in life, that's not enough. Then came making children first class human beings. More important than academics was being human, to make them empathize, sympathetic, adaptable, and also inculcate the 21st century skills of uh, adaptability, resilience, critical thinkers, make them critical thinkers, problem solvers, because that was more 
uh, required in the present day scenario so that they could tackle problems well. And last but not the least was heuristic learning. Let them be self-dependent, self-learners, because the teacher can be a facilitator, a coach, more than the one who's imparting knowledge. So uh, anything else that you would like to uh, add, Mr. Podar? No, I think it was summed up perfectly. It was absolutely spot on. Thank you. And Thank I just you. want to quickly add uh, to the last uh, question that about students uh, not being able to select and choose. Um, of course, one is as educators, as uh, teachers, we have to ensure that um, you're not trying to just fill the mind. You're trying to get the child to develop his own curiosity or her own curiosity. I've seen um, children sometimes give a wrong answer. And, you know, so you'll have sometimes teachers, principals be like, oh my God, you sit down, you sit down. What kind of an answer is that? What a silly answer. We, we revolve or we're dominated by this culture of the one right answer policy. So if the child thinks anything besides that one right answer, they don't get the marks for it. And that's why they're considered not to be that intelligent. Whereas that is itself the bane of what education should be because we want our children to develop curiosity, creative capacities and have them think outside the box. So I heard teachers and educators say, no, no, no. I don't ever tell the child to keep quiet or tell the child to do that. But do you stop the other children from sniggering, laughing when he says a wrong answer? No. You should stop that because you should, oh, what a wonderful answer. I didn't think of that. Maybe yes. we can look at it from that perspective. So it's important. The second thing was about the choice that children after 12th may not know what to choose and all of that. That's absolutely okay. It's normal to each one of you out here. How many times in your life did you know for certain that this is the only thing I want to be or want to do? It changes. It's okay. It's normal. It's dynamic. In university in US, an average undergrad changes their major 2.2 times, which means that in a four-year undergrad course, and it's a very flexible course where you have your first year, freshman year and sophomore year are pretty, uh, you're taking uh, uh, the foundational courses. So you have that flexibility to go into a different stream, but the average undergrad in the US changes their major 2.2 times in a four-year period. So it's absolutely okay if children don't know what to do when they are 18. Did you know what you want to do when you were 18? And how many times did that change after when you became 20, 25, 30, 35 or whatever? So it's okay. I mean, um, each child has their own right time. Um, Trump became president at 70. Obama retired as president at 55. So each one of us has our own right time. There's no race with anyone else. The race is only with ourselves. True. Oh. So it's all perception and how we uh, approach. Absolutely. Right? So thank you so much. And I thank all the leaders present for today's session. And uh, Mr. Podar, a big thank you to you because there was a lot of learning that has taken place today. Thank Namaskar. you so much. Thank you and Gurudev Baba. Gurudev Baba.